Okay, uh, this month we're going to look at uh, parsing with Boost Spirit X3. This is the third generation of the Spirit Library. About 10 years ago, we looked at Spirit 2, almost 10 years ago. It was one of our first presentations. Uh, if you go to the Boost website and drill into the documentation for Spirit, you'll get landed on the Spirit 2 page. And at the very bottom of this page is a little note that says, for the newest C++14 version, please follow to Spirit X3. And Spirit X3 is what we're going to be talking about today. So <clears throat> there's actually three versions of Spirit. There's Spirit Classic, Spirit, Spirit 2, which we talked about, as I said, almost 10 years ago, and Spirit X3, which requires C++14 and uh, there's actually a warning you will get with uh, the re most recent version of Spirit X3 that says uh, soon they're gonna require minimum C++17 so that's what I've set up my project to be a C++17 now uh, the documentation in here is is pretty good it's a little sparse in spirit x3 compared to spirit 2 so sometimes if you find something is a little bit too terse in the documentation I would recommend that you just go and look at the equivalent thing in spirit 2 uh, and it'll be a little bit more uh, detailed in the explanation there but basically uh, let's just take a look here so if you've seen in you know like a internet request for comments document or file format description a grammar written as a series of productions it might have looked like this each line is considered a production the thing on the left is some kind of uh, token that is represented by the things on the right and these rules end up being mutually recursive. You see that in this little example, a group expands to a parenthesis, open paren, and then expression, and then a closed paren. And then you see that a factor ex can expand to a group, and a term can expand to a factor, and an expression can expand to a term. So this is a series of rules that represents valid uh, expressions for this grammar for whatever this this thing is describing now what this happens to be describing a simple expression you know like uh, grammar using uh, multiplicative operators star and slash additive operators plus and minus and the way that the grammar is written out implicitly encodes the precedence so you see that a an expression can be uh, a term followed by another plus term and then a minus term and this asterisk here around this expression indicates zero or more of the thing that's in the expression so this is so-called bacchus nauer form or extended bacchus nauer form uh, ebnf so you often see grammars described as a BNF grammar uh, or an EBNF. And the idea here is that uh, if you can write a recursive descent parser, so a series of functions that are recursively calling each other to directly represent each one of these productions, and when it uh, when a uh, production is uh, evaluated it parses the nested non-terminal expression in you know, non-terminal values you know as a as a function call now um, in the past we've talked about um, expression templates as a means for writing a domain specific language directly in C++ source code and the idea there is you write a piece of C++ code and that evaluates to uh, a, a, a usually a call to a templated function that 
produces a, a piece of code that acts as a placeholder to represent the structure of whatever it is in this domain specific language you're trying to represent so the idea behind spirit is that we can use the expression template technique to write our grammar directly in C++ in a form that is close to but not identical to extended back as an hour form so down here in this the second code snippet you can see that they've written a uh, group and then instead of as uh, you know back as an hour uh, colon colon equal they've written a regular C++ equal and then a character literal followed by an expression followed by another character literal now in BNF sequences are represented just by juxtaposing them adjacent to each other but since we don't have implicit operators in C++ we have to use an explicit operator to join elements together into some kind of sequence so the uh, greater greater operator is used as a sequencing operator to create a sequence of uh, tokens non-terminals and literals on the right hand side of a grammar rule and we are assigning that to the left hand side uh, and in BNF the vertical bar is used as selecting alternatives we can directly use the uh, vertical bar operator in C++ to represent alternatives and instead of uh, what's called in BNF the clean star which would appear as a suffix operator we're using the prefix operator star in C++ to represent a uh, zero or more repeating sequence so this code on the bottom is valid C++ code that turns into uh, an expression template uh, there's a comment in the uh, chat that says the screen is blank on your end uh, just try F5 otherwise if you're having still having problems you'll have to watch the video on YouTube all I can do is uh, share from my end uh, so where were we okay we were saying this is a sequence of C++ code using expression templates that encodes the idea of this grammar and that is the basic notion for everything in boost spirit and they show some examples here of valid expressions that can be parsed by that grammar and then they go through and write how they explain how certain things in BNF can't be directly represented so they use a C++ operators to represent the corresponding thing so given that uh, what we want to do is for our grammar first identify uh, the BNF form of the grammar and then convert that to the corresponding spirit template expressions and then we can evoke spirits parse function on a pair of iterators to parse text and it will tell us if the text matches the grammar that we were given now usually you want to do more than matching usually you want to extract the parsed values from the individual pieces so if we go back to this over here uh, we want to extract you know what was the actual thing that represented this factor or what was the thing that actually represented this expression and the way you do that normally is you parse your text into an abstract syntax tree and the abstract syntax tree represents the structure of the parsed input and we will see with boost spirit that there's um, a way to do this in a kind of uh, procedural manner where you can associate an action to be taken with every rule that matches and then you can extract attributes from the matched right hand side and use it to compute a value for the parsed left hand side and that's um, not bad if uh, what you intend to do is just 
immediately perform some computation on the parsed result as you go and you don't care about the, the structure in the end but usually what you care about is uh, you want to invoke the parse get back some kind of recursive data structure that represents the parsed structure uh, why is it a recursive data structure well it's a recursive data structure because these different elements in the grammar are mutually recursive within each other so to represent that as a parsed abstract syntax tree we need to record that structure in some kind of recursive data structure. So usually what you want to do is get back that parsed data structure and then afterwards you want to traverse over that parsed data structure either to transform it or to process it uh, rec you know, in, in conjunction with its recursive structure. So um, in the spirit docs they have a series of abstracts that they go through where they explain, you know, here's what, you know, uh, syntax diagrams look like for, you know, arbitrary uh, grammar parsing. This is all just showing you uh, kind of a data flow like way of representing a grammar as a sequence of uh, elements. Um, and they that there is a formal notion of a thing called a parsing expression grammar and this is a derivative of extended Bacchus Naur form and everything that spirit represents is a uh, basically a parsing expression grammar that that is the underlying abstraction that uh, boost spirit is able to parse um, I'll be honest and the abstract parsing expression grammars are, are I, I rarely look at them. I just look at the actual template expression constructs that I use to represent my grammar. Um, but this can be a useful way of, you know, starting with your grammar in the abstract and then transforming that uh, peg representation into what you need when you're writing a spirit expressions. So, as I said, you're normally you want to extract out values from the parsed input and for every parser in spirit there is a so an associated attribute and the example here is showing how they've got a string with some text and they're going to parse from that string uh, passing in a begin end iterator pair they're gonna parse out an integer using the built-in uh, integer parser from spirit and they're going to parse that into an attribute, which is this final value argument passed to the parse function. <coughs> Excuse me. So, since this text input matches the sequence, the sequence of characters that is parsed by the integer parser, and since uh, int is a reserved t uh, keyword in C++, the built-in parser to spirit that parses an integer as int underscore. You'll see that with uh, the primitive parsers that parse the various primitive data types in C++. They just suffix the uh, keyword with an underscore to indicate the parser for parsing that. All of this stuff is, by the way, it's inside a boost, double colon spirit, double colon x3 namespace. We'll, we'll, when we get to looking at the example code that I've created, we'll see what the uh, include structure looks like a little bit and uh, what the uh, various names are that are coming from various namespaces. So every parser has an associated an attribute and that's how you, the, the attribute is how you get access to the value that corresponds to the parsed text. Uh, when it comes to things like a sequence or more complicated parsers uh, that produce can that produce multiple values. Um, basically, Spirit turns everything into a tuple. Now, uh, you may not be familiar with uh, std tuple, but you may be familiar with std pair from using a associative container like map, where the pair represents a key value entry in the map, and a tuple is just a generalization of pair to an arbitrary number of types. And when Boost Spirit 
parses a sequence of items, it turn, the, the corresponding attribute is a tuple. The types in the tuple correspond to the individual types of the values in the sequence. So here they've got a value A of type cap A and a value B of type cap B. And when the sequence A followed by B is parsed and parsed successfully, that results in an attribute that is a tuple of type cap A and cap B. So if um, we go back a little bit, let's go back over here to this introduction. So here we have um, a term followed by zero or more terms. And so we end up with a tuple of an arbitrary number of terms. And what Spirit will do is simplify that into a vector of whatever the attribute is for a term. So um, it's every parser has a synthesized attribute and sequences of parsers produce tuple attributes and if all the types of the tuple are the same it turns into a vector of that type instead of you know and so if it was two ints instead of being tuple int come int it'll just turn into vector of int and in this way uh, it's just is going here describing how things get simplified Uh, down here, compound attribute rules. This is what we want to look at. So, Spirit has a lot of machinery based on the types of the individual things that you're parsing in a compound sequence to try and produce an attribute that is the simplest kind of type for the rule that you've written. So here we see if it's a sequence, A followed by B, if A and B have distinct types, then you get a tuple of A and B. If A has an attribute, but B does not, then you just get A. So there's no point in having a tuple with a single a type. So instead of making a tuple of A, it just produces an attribute of type A. Uh, there's a special type inside Spirit that's basically just a tag. A, it's a named type that doesn't have any useful definition associated with it. It's just used to discriminate uh, template arguments within this template expression framework that is implemented by Spirit to write a, so you can write your parser as a domain specific language. This unused type represents you've parsed some, uh, you know, value out of the text, but you don't care about the value. So, um, for instance, uh, character and string literals don't produce a value because since they're literals, you know what the text was already. It's inferred. So when we were parsing an expression surrounded by parentheses, there's no attribute associated with those per parentheses character literals. They're uh, implicit in the structure. Y you know if it's an expression that it may have had parentheses around it, you know, by the way you've written your grammar. Uh, we'll get into the expectation operator in a second, but it, it's basically sim in terms of the attribute rules, it's the same as sequence. And then it gets more interesting when we look at an alternative. An alternative means the value could be one of two types, but it, it, it only has a single value. So, that is represented as a boost variant. Now, if one of the attributes is unused for one of these alternatives, then it just turn it it uh, degrades, if you will, into an optional, which is it can it can hold a value of type A or it can hold nothing. If it held nothing, it's the, it's the B that got matched because B didn't have an attribute type. Uh, now, if it's um, an alternative of three here, 
they're showing it and, and C is one of the alternatives has no attribute then it either contains a variant of an A or a B or it contains nothing so it's that variant of A or B is contained within an optional um, we'll explain what difference is here but basically the attribute ends up being whatever is associated with the part before the minus operator uh, clean star you end up with a vector of the attributes of that's contained within the nested parser uh, plus is one or so clean star is zero or more plus is one or more so again we end up with our attribute type being a vector uh, a list this is a sequence of items separated by some list separator so again that turns into a vector that the list separator disappears uh, we can um, have an explicit number of repeated items as a parser so it's an exp you know this repeat is some minimum and maximum count and it's we're, we're repeating whatever is parsed by a so that turns into a vector of a it's just um, I mean I suppose they could have made it stood array of a but uh, it, it, it's simpler to have everything that is represents the, a, a stack of attributes of the same type as a, as a vector uh, either the thing is present or it's not is the optional parser so we get you know an optional of a as the attribute type uh, these uh, ampersand a and not b those are a way of matching a head in the input without actually consuming the input so um, although those parsers can succeed they don't have any corresponding attribute because the thing that they're matching against is a look ahead in the input and not actually consumed in the input itself so we've got this idea of parsers that parse primitives we got this idea of compound parsers that uh, parse sequences of non-terminals and other primitives and we've got this idea of an attribute associated with every parser and we've got this idea of attribute rules that take uh, the attributes of complex sequences uh, in a production and simplify them down as much as possible and I'm not going to go through every single step in the tutorial here it, it, I would recommend it if you're if you're new to all this stuff that you start with their tutorials and work your way through them one by one but uh, I mentioned that there's a way to kind of do imperative uh, value association with a rule and that's through the use of semantic actions so here I'm skipping down here into this uh, example they're calling parse with a begin iterator the last iterator and this is the inline grammar that represents the thing we're going to parse so this is looking for integers surrounded by curly braces now the curly brace character literal parser doesn't have an attribute so there's nothing interesting going on there but the int underscore parser that parses an integer it has a corresponding attribute that is of type int and what we can do is attach what's called a semantic action to a parser by placing the semantic action inside square brackets after the parser the semantic action in this case we are um, instantiating an anonymous instance of this print action struct which they've defined up here so a semantic action is a functor <coughs> excuse me it's a functor what's a functor a functor is just a struct with a function a, a function call operator the function call operator will take a context by const reference and that context type is going to vary depending on the on the parser so it's typically written as a template member function and using these special context access functions we can either access 
the value of stuff on the right. Uh, sorry, we can uh, we can use val to assign the attribute for this rule. Uh, we can get the location in the input stream that ma that was used to match this rule. We can use the attr the adder function to access the attribute of the thing on the right. In this example, it's an anonymous rule, so there's no thing on. I mean, we could assign, you know the underscore val of this thing but really what we want to get at is this uh, the value of this int underscore parser so that's what the adder is used for so inside this print actions functor that they've written it's going to access the value of the parser that this action is associated with which in our case is int underscore from the context and it's just going to print it to standard out so in this example, when they parse this text, it will print to standard out any integer that it parses. Uh, so we will successfully parse an integer, and then the semantic action associated with that parser will be invoked. Now, you can also, uh, here they've done it as a lambda. So instead of writing a functor as a class with a function call operator, they've just written a lambda and applied the semantic action to the parser by using a lambda function because a lambda is just syntactic shorthand for writing a functor class so semantic actions they can be handy for um, small examples but when you write larger grammars that parse more complicated structures it gets a little bit confusing, a little bit unreadable to have the semantic actions decorating your grammar because your grammar is written in a declarative style, but your semantic actions are running in an imperative style. So it's a clash of programming styles to mix them all together. For a simple example like this, it's, it's not so bad. But when we get to more complicated examples, usually want to separate the action taken on the parsed values from the parsing of the values themselves. So for more complicated examples, the best thing to do is to use the attributes associated with the rules in your grammar to build an abstract syntax tree from the parse and then traverse the parse uh, using a visitor pattern, w which we'll look at in a moment and this keeps the processing of the structure separate from the parsing of the structure kind of keeps the keeps things clean so as they go through their example here first they they write a parser to parse complex numbers they write a parser that sums up numbers uh, using semantic actions um, and then when they get to this example stuffing numbers into a std vector they're still using semantic actions. They're using a lambda that takes the value that was parsed and pushes it onto a vector that was passed into this function by reference. So they're capturing the reference to the vector v and then using the semantic action to push onto that vector everything that they parsed. Now, when they iterate through this example there's a couple things that they've changed so let's go back and refresh ourselves what the this earlier version looked like so we are parsing a double pushing it onto our vector and then we had clean star so zero or more a double followed by a sequence of zero or more additional doubles with a comma separating each uh, set of adjacent doubles so number comma number comma number comma number comma number every time we parse a number out we push it onto this vector and we ha can have a number followed by more numbers as long as there are commas separating the numbers so it's a comma separated list it, and notice that 
the way that this is written, this is zero or more sequences of comma followed by another number. So if we have number and then just comma, this will not match the parse. It will, be, because it requires that another number follow the comma. And if our, if our input was just, you know, five comma, the five would match this. The comma would match this first part, but there's no additional number. So this part fails. It fails to match. And what happens on uh, when we call phrase parse here, and not all of the input was consumed, it tells us, oh, uh, we, we successfully you know, matched some of the input, but the iterators didn't consume the entire input stream. So it's a common thing in Boost Spirit to say, hey, parse some of the stuff, and then at the end, check to see if we parsed all of it. And it, you might ask, like, why is that separated into two steps? It's like, well, you might parse a portion of the, gra of the input using one grammar and then switch to another grammar to parse the rest of the input, or perhaps there's a bit of input on the front that's matched by your grammar, and then there's a binary blob at the end. It, it, the, the data stream is up to the application, so it's, it, it's not up for spirit to decide that just because we didn't consume all the input, that that means that parsing failed. So you'll see this idiom in your uh, spirit-based grammar. Normally, you want to consume all the input and have it matched by your grammar. So here they've parsed the input, and then if the entire input was not consumed by the parse, then we were consider that a failure result. So using semantic actions, we're pushing the values onto this vector as we parse them. In this final iteration, instead of doing uh, a double followed by zero or more comma zero more sequences of comma and another double, there's a shortcut grammar using the percent operator that represents a list of items, namely doubles, in this example, that are separated by the thing on the right. So the comma is used to separate the doubles. Now you might ask yourself, um, what happens when there's white space in the input? And in a normal grammar, like for a programming language or something like that, it's just implicitly assumed that all of the tokens are, you know, maybe separated by arbitrary amounts of white space. And that is controlled by um, spirit as well. This, we haven't talked about it yet, but this uh, fourth argument to phrase parse represents a grammar that identifies what are the skippable white space between tokens. And we're using, uh, in this example, it's using the space grammar from boost spirit x3 ASCII. So there is <coughs> a grammar representing white space for ASCII, but the white space in EBCDIC is different. The white space in UTF is different, UTF-8. So there's other namespaces representing the, the space character, valid white space characters in those other character encodings. So Boost Spirit doesn't assume any particular character encoding. Um, an individual parser may. In this case, the space character, uh, white space character parser from the ASCII uh, namespace encodes white space for ASCII. So that's space, horizontal tab, vertical tab, form feed, carriage turn, line feed. Those are the typical white space characters in ASCII. If you've ever used the, the C type header and called, you know, is space, those are the kinds of characters that would be matched for uh, ASCII character codes. Now, we got the shorthand to represent a list of elements each element matched by a parser separated by some separating uh, text. The parser is the parser for a double. This is the built-in parser for 
a double uh, as opposed to a float. There's a built-in parser for float as well. And the separator is the comma character. So the natural synthesized attribute for this parser is a vector of double, which is exactly the type of the uh, argument that we're passing into this function. So here, instead of using a semantic attribute every time we parse a double to push a value onto this vector, we're just passing the vector directly to phrase parse. And because vector of double is the natural synthesized attribute type for the list parser of double and comma, we didn't have to do anything at all. We didn't have to write any additional uh, imperative code that is attached to our parser. Our parser got nice and clean. It became, you know, we simplified it by using this list parser, but we also got rid of the semantic attributes, uh, sorry, the semantic actions. So we didn't need to mix that imperative code with our declarative code. And we just let boost spirit handle sticking the values into the vector. So that's basically, this This is the goal, is to write a parser for the input we're trying to match and use the natural synthesized attribute types from Boost Spirit to match the input directly so we don't have to manipulate some kind of, you know, build up a value inter, in an intermediate way. We saw back here when we looked at the compound attribute rules, we can get sequences we can get alternatives and we can get uh, optionally present uh, values there and we can get optionally present values here so the synthesized attribute types are going to easily handle lists they're going to easily handle one or more uh, alternatives and they're going to handle optionally present stuff in the input so, as I say, uh, if you're new to kind of this uh, parsing stuff, walk through these examples in the tutorials, walk through them one by one, because they get more complicated as they go and they depend on what they've shown you in the past, in the previous examples. Uh, but let's take a look at uh, some of the built-in parsers that are inside Spirit. So, if you just write a character by itself it'll match a character it'll match that correspond it, write a character literal it'll match that character literal and it has no attribute now because of the uh, operator precedence and so on of C++ operators remember in C++ you can write custom operators but you can't change their precedence so the way that C++ parses things, sometimes you have to decorate a literal to indicate that we intend to create this template expression that represents a parser that parses a literal as opposed to just the actual literal itself. So if you see lit of, you know, apostrophe A apostrophe, that is a way to say, you know, parse the literal character A. Um, there's a care parser that matches any character. If you use a care parser with a specific character, it only matches that one character. The difference between care of a specific character is that the attribute is produced as opposed to with the lit. There's no attribute. Um, you can parse, write a parser that matches a range of characters. Um, you can write a parser that matches all the characters in a specific character set and then there's some uh, you know the alnum alnum alphanumeric represents either uh, an alphabetic character or a numeric character so any of the letters uppercase a through z or lowercase a through z and any of the digits 0 through 9 is matched by the alnum parser and that corresponds to the function from the C type header that tells you whether or not a character is of a particular character class. Uh, and alpha for 
just alphabetic, upper or lower case. Uh, you've got blank, control characters, digits, graphable characters, uh, printable characters, punctuation, space characters, uh, hex digits, so the digits 0 through 9 and the letters A through F, either upper or lower case, or you can match specifically lower or uppercase characters. For numeric parsers, you've got float, double, long double, and then you can also parse binary values out of the input stream. So the input stream is not assumed to be text. It's assumed to be a sequence of whatever type is iterated over by the iterators that you're passing to phrase parse or to parse. So we can parse binary integers. Uh, we can parse uh, octal text. So expecting text representing an integer but only using octal digits 0 through 7. Um, sorry, I said bin here. This is a this is a <clears throat> a binary integer using only digits 0 and 1. Uh, these are all numeric parsers that parse text. There, there's a s subsequent page we'll look at in a second where you can parse binary values. So parsing uh, binary text, octal text, hexadecimal text, parse an integer into an unsigned short, and so on, unsigned long, unsigned int, unsigned long long, short, long, int, long long. Uh, for string parsers, you can, uh, again, you can match a string literal. If the operator precedence is such that C++ doesn't understand that you're trying to represent the parser associated with parsing a string literal and not the string literal itself, you can use the lit function to get a parser that parses a literal string. And um, it's also possible to use string. Well, lit parses it parses the string but does not produce an attribute. String parses the string and produces it as an attribute. Uh, symbols is kind of an interesting parser for strings and it allows you to associate uh, a, a piece of a, a, associate a string with a value and in their Roman numerals example here, they build a symbol table that matches the various Roman numeral letter values with the corresponding decimal values. So if you want to see an example of how uh, the symbol table parser works, that Roman numeral um, symbol table, sorry, the Roman numeral example shows use of a symbol table. Uh, you can stick values into the symbol table and then when you use the uh, parser, to which you've added the name uh, and value pairs, then when it uh, evaluates as a match in the parsing, its attribute will be the type of whatever the values are that are associated with the keys in the symbol table. These auxiliary parsers uh, can be useful um, most of the time you don't need to match this explicitly, but you can match against end of line or the end of the input. Um, epsilon is just a parser that doesn't consume any input. Sometimes it's useful when you're writing a rule to, to, to have epsilon in there. Um, you can have epsilon with a binary condition, and if the condition is true, then it will match an empty string, otherwise it will fail. Uh, and there's a way to do uh, a lazy parsing which means that the parser is invoked at parse time uh, so you can essentially do like some dynamic uh, approaches here. It's more of an advanced thing uh, for a lazy parser. And sometimes, and we'll see an example of this, sometimes you want to insert a specific attribute as a specific value as the attribute value for this rule but the thing that you've parsed against didn't produce this, the attribute you were interested in or it didn't produce an attribute at, at all. For instance, you know, like these EOLs or whatever. Sometimes you can uh, use this to insert 
the attribute that you want to appear so you don't have to go and fix it up later uh, by traversing the parsed AST. Uh, again, I mentioned there are parsers to parse binary values in the input stream so you can parse bytes, 16-bit words, 32-bit words, and 64-bit words. Uh, there's no 128-bit word parser, uh, which um, I suppose you could just look at the, since Spirit is all open source, right, and it's a header-only library, so you can just go look at how these parsers are implemented, and you can implement a 128-bit value parser if you so need it. Um, we haven't discussed it yet, but there's a thing called directives that allow you to apply a behavior wrapped around another parser. We mentioned that when you invoke the parser, uh, with phrase parse or parse that there's a skipping grammar that's provided that identifies white space to be skipped between tokens but you can disable that for a particular rule or a particular parser by using the lexeme directive and a time where you want to use this is suppose you're parsing a uh, quoted string where the quoted string ha can have embedded spaces. So you don't want to skip those spaces. You want to preserve them as part of the value. And an example of that is shown in this employee uh, example, or a tutorial rather, this employee tor tutorial. They are parsing a quoted string by using the lexeme directive to say that the value is open quote uh, they didn't need to use lit here because the only thing acceptable inside the di lexeme directive is another parser so it knows that this has to be a parser so quote followed by one or more characters that doesn't contain quote so when we say a minus b we're matching the thing a as long as it doesn't contain a b if a b shows up then we stop so this is any character except double quote a sequence of one or more of those inside double quotes and by wrapping the whole thing in lexeme we're guaranteeing that we preserve the white space inside here matched by this uh, care parser so we end up the attribute ends up being remember for literals there's no corresponding attribute so these things drop out in terms of how they participate in the attribute so we just end up with a vector of care and it turns out a vector of care is just compatible with std string. So we can just e extract that and stick it into a, a std string. So uh, Lexeme is probably the most common parser directive that you would use. Uh, some probably next most common might be uh, the no case, which says you inhibit case sensitivity for whatever the nested parser is. Uh, repeat is also pretty commonly used. Uh, omit sometimes you want to use a nested parser but you just you don't care about the parsed attribute maybe because it's part of the input stream that you want to parse to make sure it matches the structure but you don't actually care what its value is what its attribute value is so by using omit you can parse the structure make sure it matches the, the expected structure but then since you don't care about the value, there's no point in storing that in your AST, so you can wrap that in an, o, an omit directive. So you match the structure, but you don't care about whatever value comes out of that. Uh, repeat is pretty uh, common as well. There's different forms of repeat to say, you know, zero or n to m or a uh, specific number. Um, parser operators, I, I think honestly this is a bug in the documentation because the expression over here is written not in C++ syntax uh, we saw the actual syntax over here for the compound attribute rules uh, we saw that you know uh, plus a turned into a vector of one or more a and then down here in this operators, it, it just says plus. It doesn't it doesn't show the syntax. I think that's just uh, an omission in the documentation. If if you go and look at the the spirit two documentation, it's written out here. Uh, so if we kind of match it back up, the optional optional was tilde a might be a little bit 
or sorry, it's dash A. It's dash A is optional. So this optional here is, is saying dash A, parse 0 or, or 1. Um, at any rate, I, I just think that's an oversight in the documentation, something to be aware of. Um, and then the reference, you know, semantic action is just use the square bracket syntax to apply that semantic action function to the, or it's invoked when the corresponding parser succeeds. Uh, now, so far we just looked at kind of primitive parsers, you know, like double underscore and so on. But when you get to a larger grammar, you want to arrange things into a sequence of rules. And the way to do that is you um, you write, you, you invoke, you know, spirit x boost, spirit x3 rule template. This ID is just a type that I d is used to discriminate different rules. And then the adder argument is the type of the corresponding attribute associated with this rule. Now, it's we'll see this when we look in the code. It's kind of a little bit goofy because we are essentially declaring that for whatever type this ID is, it's associated with an attribute type. And then we're assigning this name to it, which is just a string literal. And the, the end result is just kind of a way to, to uh, construct some metadata scaffolding. It doesn't actually, this name does not actually contain the parser expression that, that performs a successful parse. That's done down here in this r underscore def. It's a little bit confusing. Th this underscore def business it has to be called underscore def no matter what your underscore lower underscore lowercase def it has to be called that because this boost spirit define macro is going to expand into some text that associates this r underscore def with this r so it's kind of goofy uh, it is like it, it, it goes through this macro mechanism and it's kind of opaque We'll see what it looks like uh, in the sample code that I've written. In, in my sample code, I've used a different identifier naming convention from what Boost Spirit uses itself. I used, um, what do they call it, camel case? And that way you can tell which identifiers you get to name your own way and which identifiers have to have special naming conventions associated with the macros in boost spirit so I tr and when we look at the the sample code I've tried to make that clear but this this is how we're gonna define a rule a rule will have a discriminating type that's just used as its ID it'll have a type of its attribute it'll have a text name and then it will have a parser definition and then we glue all that junk together with this boost spirit define macro and that's a little bit different from Spirit Classic, or which, you know, Spirit, sorry, Spirit Classic is, is Spirit version 1. Spirit 2, they had an actual data type for a grammar. In Spirit X3, there's no explicit data type for a grammar. There's just rules, and then there's parsers. And a rule is uh, invoking a collection of parsers to identify a rule. So... Let's look at some code. Um, I am using VC package to get a hold of boost spirit. And uh, I'm using boost variant as my abstract for part of my abstract data type. And I'm using gtest for unit testing. Now, if you've, if you've played with boost spirit or other boost libraries before, you may have found it difficult to identify exactly which components of boost you need to grab down in order to use a particular library because Boost Spirit pulls in a bunch of other libraries from Boost, but it doesn't pull in all of them. So, you know, do you need to download all of Boost and do you need to compile it, blah, blah, blah. VC package just 
makes that really simple. You say, I want boost spirit. It'll pull down boost spirit and whatever boost spirit needs. And I'm also using boost variant. So it'll pull that down and whatever that needs. And it'll pull down G test and whatever G test needs. So it just simplifies your life considerably. Now my, uh, my top level C make pretty standard stuff. I'm just turning off on, uh, use of folders. Um, I tell boost not to warn me about new versions because, uh, I may use a version of boost that doesn't quite understand my totally up to date C++ compiler. So just, you know, stop warning me about like, I've got a newer compiler than what boost knows about, but we're going to do a standard find package to get boost. I've got my implementation subdirectory and I've got my, uh, if I'm doing building tests, I've got my test subdirectory. I'm using uh, ctest to capture my tests. Uh, let's just go down here and look at my parsing implementation. I've got a bunch of header files in an include directory and I've got two parsers in this current directory. And I'm going to stick that in a library. Uh, if they're consuming this library, they need the include directory added to their search path. This library depends on boost. And I am setting the standard for this target to be C17. And by doing a target compile features public, anybody who consumes this library will have the C17 standard requirement propagated out. And the reason you want to do that, well, it's not absolutely required because we are, you'll see in a second that we are hiding a lot of the boost spirit uh, complexity inside a translation units and wrapping it in a convenience function. So the client library, clients of this library are not directly exposed to the parser which is the part that requires requires C++14 and issues a warning unless you've told it to compile with C++17. But sa safest thing to do is to propagate that uh, requirement out. Um, that's the CMake for the library. And then the test is we're just making a test executable. Um, I've got a little complex number class that I, I wrote some code for that's going to be used in this uh, simplified parser. And then when we have the, the full blown parser, we're going to test that as well. I'm linking against my implementation library, frac form for fractal formula, and I'm linking against G test and I'm going to call G test discover tests so that C test will take each one of my G test test cases and turn it into a C test test case. So that way it can run all my tests from a uh, continuous integration environment just by invoking C test. Uh, if I'm if I'm running the test executable directly here from the IDE, then you know I'm just running the test executable. It doesn't I, I don't need the C test business, but C test is using the C test integration is good for continuous integration. So let's take a look at our simple parser. We'll just hide that since we don't need to see that right now. Okay, so oops, uh, for Unix guys, we need to make this case match. Okay, so in my implementation, I've got this complex value struct. It's just a simple struct where a complex value is represented as a real part and an imaginary part. I've got an equality operator, I've got an inequality operator, and I've got a stream insertion operator. So my parser is going to take some text as a std string, and it's going to parse out a value of type complex, and it's going to return a bool indicating whether or not parsing was successful. So if we go over here and look at our test code, uh, we're saying that mm. parsing fails on an empty string because we are requiring that there be a value in the input. Uh, we can parse a real number. We can parse the value i that represents the 
square root of minus 1, that is, you know, the fundamental uh, attribute of complex numbers is that they have a real part and an imaginary part. And when we're writing, you know, standard mathematics on the whiteboard, we write i to represent, you know, the, the value of square root minus 1, which represents, you know, a unit 1 value on the imaginary axis. So if we parse i, that parse should succeed, and we should get a complex value of unit 1 on the imaginary axis. We can also write i as a suffix on a, a literal. Here I've separated the literal from the i suffix with some white space because that should be perfectly acceptable. And that should represent the, the literal times uh, or the literal value should be representing the value on the imaginary axis that we expect out. So that should parse and we should get that value back. So if we take a look at this implementation, uh, let's just ignore the part up top first and let's just look at this little function and what it's doing. I'm using white space skipper from ASCII. I'm using the double parser uh, from X3. I'm using the phrase parse function from X3. X3 is just a namespace alias for boost spirit X3, just to shorten the names down a little bit. Okay, so uh, my iterator type is the const iterator for a std string. I've got an iterator representing the beginning, a const iterator representing the end, and I'm going to call phrase parse with the iterator pair my parser, which is in this uh, variable literal. We'll look at that in a second. This is my skipping parser, is the space parser from ASCII space, and the attribute is of type complex. I'm going to do that phrase parse, and the result, I, I'm going to consider a, sex, a successful parse to be when this phrase parse returns true, and we've consumed all the input. Uh, some things to note is that the begin iterator to phrase parse is accepted by reference, not by const reference. So that's why this is declared non-const iterator. It's, it, the, the type is const underscore iterator, which means it's iterating over constant characters. But my iterator for the begin is not constant because it's going to be modified. That's, that's how I'm able to check at the end whether begin equals end, because begin is going to get modified by phrase parse. End will not be modified because it's declared const. So let's take a look at my, my parser, this literal thing. So I've got a rule. Its tag is this struct literal. Remember this tag, this ID, it's just the name of a type. It doesn't have to be defined or have any specific value. Uh, or it doesn't have to be defined at all to have a definition. So I'm just declaring it as a struct in order to have a discriminating type that I can use as an ID. The value of the attribute is complex. And its string name is just literal. And the definition of the parser associated with that rule is it's either an imaginary value or it's a real value and I'm using the boost spirit define to tie this underscore def with this name here so it's this name is associated with name underscore def by this boost spirit define macro it, the, the, there's a couple of these little macros. There's a there's a forward declaring macro and there's a defining macro and there's an instantiating macro I know the spirit authors probably worked really hard to try and get rid of this macro, but it was a compromise that resulted in, you know, the uh, the least amount of uh, stuff that you needed to do. So it's just it, it's how it is. For an imaginary, again, I got my tag. It's uh, a rule of type the tag type is imaginary and the attribute type is complex and I've got the definition here so here I'm using the lit parser to say that the thing that is parsed is either just an I alone or it is 
a double followed by an I. And you see that I've got semantic actions associated with the two alternatives. The semantic actions either assign I or assign imaginary. This is the thing that's creating the complex type that is my attribute type. So I am saying in these uh, semantic actions, I'm saying the value of this of the attribute associated with the rule is this thing on the right. In the case of an I, it's just a complex with a zero for real part and a one for the imaginary part with the um, other alternative that is a double followed by I. It is the the attribute for the rule is a complex number whose real part is zero and whose imaginary part is the attribute of the double parser. So I'm using the adder to get at the attribute of this stuff. And since a lit has no attribute and a double follow, and so the, the attribute type of lit is unused and then the, the sequence of double followed by unused just boils down to the attribute type being double for everything that I have highlighted there. So that allows me to get at that double by using the underscore adder function. And I'm assigning the synthesized attribute for the rule by grabbing a piece of the attribute that of what was parsed. So the right-hand side of the rule I'm getting from underscore adder and I'm assigning the left hand the attribute of the left hand side of the rule with underscore val. And for real, it's very similar except I'm just doing this assign real and so instead of assigning to the imaginary component of the complex, I am assigning to the real component of the complex. And by sticking all this inside a convenience function. Oops, I got the case mismatched up there again. I initially had it as a lowercase file and switched it to uppercase and Windows doesn't care, but Unix won't be happy, so we'll fix that. Uh, by hiding all this spirit stuff inside this convenience function, I'm doing two things. One, I am decoupling all clients of the parser from the implementation of the parser, so that's a good thing. And second, nobody that's going to call this parser has to um, uh, incur any overhead from uh, including and parsing these header files that implement the spirit parsing framework. So that's just good compiler firewall practice there. Uh, if we take a look at these, if we just, we'll just kind of debug one of these, uh, we'll run this in the debugger, since I changed those lowercase include names to uppercase, it's going to compile some stuff. Okay, and let's bring over some things so you can see variables. Put this on the bottom, a little smaller. Put this over here. Okay, so here's local variables on the right and whatever automatically uh, Visual Studio decided to show me on the left. So I got my value, my expected value. I've, I've set the expected value to something that is different from what it should actually be so that, sorry, I initialized my value to something then other than what I expect to be parsed so I can guarantee that when I compare these two, the expected and the actual, that they don't accidentally match with with code that fails if we step into this parsing code I was going to construct a string from my character literal so now we're inside my little parsing helper function uh, we're going to get the iterators and then if you, if we want to we can step inside phrase parse and we find out that it it delegates to some things and then it is going to invoke the template machinery from the template expression that was created to represent my parser and start traversing all those parsers uh, and if they all match then we will 
come out of this function with success. So I'm not going to step into this. I'm going to step over. And we see that the result was true. So it successfully parsed the input. And we're going to invoke the post skipper parser, return the value there, bubble that out. And we come back, and that was true. And we see that my begin iterator has now advanced to the end of this string. So it now begin now points to the end of the string. And because begin equals end, that part was true, and the phrase parse was true. So the result of this all coming out was true. And now value has a real part of 0 and an imaginary part of 5, which is exactly what we expected. So this assert true on the parsed passes, and this assert equal on the expected value, and the actual value also passes. So simple example of using a parser with semantic actions. And you can see it's kind of cluttered. You know, I mean, I kind of tried to make it a little less cluttered by, you know, naming these semantic actions as separate lambda functions. And so, but, but still, like, especially over here, this is kind of a little noisy. I would really just prefer to read that an imaginary is either I or a double followed by I. And this having to attach the semantic actions on there to get this synthesized attribute is a bit annoying. So if we look at this other example, now here I've got an abstract syntax tree type that we'll look at in a second. And I'm calling parse formula instead of parse. Uh, I'm going to pass in some text and get back out a synthesized AST attribute. Now, accessing the individual pieces of that AST can be a little bit involved because it's boost variant with possible, like, you know, depending on what you wrote for your grammar, right? It can have boost optional or it can have boost variant. It can have vectors and it can have, you know, optionals of variants and optionals of vectors and so on. So getting at those individual pieces uh, procedurally can be a little bit annoying, doesn't read the best. A better way to access that stuff is to use a visitor, which we'll look at a little bit later, uh, where here I've parsed this text 3 plus 4. It, it, this formula grammar represents, you know, additive expressions and multiplicative expressions and expressions inside parentheses and even named function calls and so on. And it also represent it can also parse plain doubles and the uh, value i to represent, you know, my you know a pure imaginary value of one, and then it can represent it can parse a literal double followed by a suffix i to represent a pure imaginary number. So instead of representing a complex struct directly, like if this were 3 plus 4i, this would turn into uh, an expression for the whole thing. Uh, there would be, uh, you know, this would be parsed out as a binary plus operator, and then this would be a, a real double, and then this would be an imaginary double. But if I parse that formula, then I, you know, I've just got a pretty printer here, and I just assert that the parsing was successful, and the result of the pretty printer was 3 plus, floor, 3 plus 4 in parentheses. And if you were going to do some kind of uh, processing on the structure of the input, it's simpler to write a visitor than it is to, you know, manually pull out these pieces. As you can see, it gets pretty noisy the farther you get down into it. I mean, this is the kind of equivalent of me, like, dipping my fingers down into this structure of variants and uh, vectors and so on and pulling out individual pieces and uh, extracting them. And it, it, I mean, it's doable, but it's really noisy and it doesn't read very well. So it's... it's um, more straightforward to use a visitor. We'll, we'll look at what the visitor looks like in a second. But so let's just 
review these test cases here. Uh, an empty string is not should not return true. It's, we don't accept an empty string as a valid parse input. We can parse a real number. We can parse i. Uh, we can parse a number with an i suffix. Um, here's a thing that isn't a valid number and that parsing should fail. And uh, here we can parse, you know, a simple additive expression. Here's w uh, a malformed additive expression, so that should fail. And what I'm doing here is uh, I'm using an, an overload to capture error messages into a std string, and then I'm just asserting that there should have been a, a message in that uh, resulting errors string. It shouldn't have been non-empty. Um, we'll see what, when we run this case, we'll see what the error message looks like when it, it gets, uh, well, we, we can look at the error message when it goes. So, now, let's go down and look at the parser. So, here's my, we'll start with our little helper function, so we'll go kind of top down. My uh, overload that does not return the error message, just grab, you know, has a local variable that the error messages will be stuffed into and if uh, the parsing failed we would just print that to standard error and then return the value of the parse here's my main parse formula variant that uh, produces the error string now in this example I've got error handling and source location annotation on the grammar we'll see what that looks like in a second so in order to um, do the error handling, I have to instantiate an error handler. And I mentioned when we looked at the semantic action functions that they took a context argument. I can associate things with the context by using this uh, x3 with the tag here is used as a type that is used to associate with a value that I'm going to stick in the context. The value that I'm going to stick in is a reference to my error handler. If you're not familiar with std ref, it's just a way to get values that can be copied around where they, uh, they kind of represent copyable references. So if I need a reference but I need to copy it like a value, I can use std ref to wrap the reference and now it becomes a value that can be copied around. Uh, this expression is the rule for the, the top part, the entry point of my grammar. So my parser is a context with an error handler associated with the rule that parses the top expression. And my uh, call to phrase parse looks like we, we've seen already. I've got the iterator pair, I've got the parser, I got the skipping grammar, and I got the value that's going to be parsed out, and I'm going to check to see if begin equals end. In order to consider a sexual, successful parse, we have to consume all of the input. And then this error handler is associated with an output stream, and I'm just going to grab the string associated with that stream as my uh, returned errors value. So on a successful parse, this will set the errors string to empty. And on a failed parse, it will set the errors string to contain the error message from our error handler. So this expression thing is going to come from an instantiation of our grammar rule. That's this rule here. We're going to instantiate that rule and associate it with a context and an iterator. So the iterator is our uh, string iterator. Oh, I guess I don't need this iterator down here since I already have it up there. That's why I was getting a squiggle. The phrase parse is associated with a context and you can obtain that context and the, the space type parameter is so that we're, we're saying that the phrase parse, con, phrase parse context is associated with the ASCII space as the skipper. Uh, so this gives us 
the context associated with the, the phrase parse, and then our actual context instantiated for our rule is an X3 context. An X3 context can have nested subcontexts. It's kind of hard to say contexts. You can have nested subcontexts. And in this case, the nested subcontext is the phrase context. And we're going to associate the error handler tag with a reference to our error handler. These are types. So this is a type. It's saying that the type of our context has a tag type that's error handler tag. It has a type of the thing associated with that tag, which is stood reference wrapper of error handler of iterator. It's going to take a cons one of those. Reference stood reference wrapper is the type returned by stood ref. I'm, I'm explaining this because maybe you probably hadn't used stood ref and so it's just so you know what these things are. And then this type here is the type of the nested subcontext that's inside this X3 context. Okay, so this was some business we had to do to instantiate the top level rule that we're going to use to create our parser. So that all that business there, the, the, this uh, iterator type, this phrase context type, this context type, and this boost spirit instantiate, all of that was just so that we could pass this expression in square brackets to the x3 width so we could get a value that represent our, represented our parser. It, it, it's the mechanism that is associating the error handler with the parser. The parser itself, we're going to use boost spirit define to define rules for imaginary, additive expert, multiplicative expert, unary expert, argument list, identifier, function call, primary expert, and expression. These are all the non-terminals of our grammar. Now, boost spirit define, you could do it one by one for each of these names. But it's a variadic macro, so you might as well just, you know, accumulate up all your rules and then do boost spirit define yourself. Now again, I mentioned I'm using, you know, uh, a different casing convention than boost spirit to make it clear what names are mandatory by these macros. So. You see this underscore def. That's not me. That's coming from spirit. So this expression underscore def, it has to be named underscore def to get matched up with the boost spirit define. And here we see, let me see if I can, okay, just from this clang format off to the clang format on down here, this is the definition of our grammar. So. Let's just kind of go from the top down because that's kind of the, the simplest productions first. So an imaginary, it's either an I. If it's I, I'm going to synthesize the attribute 1.0 associated with I. And it's either an I or it's a double followed by I. Multiplicative, or sorry, additive expression is a multiplicative expression followed by zero or more additive operators followed by another multiplicative expression. Now, you, if you've got eagle eyes, you may have noticed that this is a single greater than instead of a double greater than. And that has to do with error handling. I'll explain that in a moment. You can think of it as, a, as sequencing. In the documentation, we saw it referred to as the expectation operator. But you can think of it as sequencing. And uh, But by using the expectation operator instead of the sequencing operator, we're going to get advanced error handling and better error messages when things don't match what we expect. We'll see that in a moment. So an additive expression is a multiplicative expression followed by zero or more additive operators separating uh, multiplicative expressions.
a multiplicative expression is a unary expression followed by zero or more multiplicative operators followed by another unary expression. A unary expression is either a primary expression or a primary expression with a uh, oh look I I wrote there's a bug this should be a plus doesn't make sense to have the same thing twice ha okay so it's either a primary expression or it's got the unary minus prefix to end you know so for writing minus five that gets parsed as the unary minus operator followed by five uh, this care parser will produce an attribute. If I didn't want to produce an attribute, I would be using lit. So the reason I'm using care is so we can remember was it was the unary prefix a minus or a plus? Was the multiplicative operator star or slash? Was the additive operator plus or minus? We need to remember that in our AST, so that's why we're using care as the parser type to parse a character but keep the character that was parsed as an attribute. Uh, for a function call we're going to need an argument list and the argument list is just a series of expressions separated by commas. We need to know the name of the function that we are calling and that is uh, going to be a lexeme of either it has to begin with an alpha or an underscore and then it's followed by zero or more alphanumeric or underscore characters. All of that will be snatched up into uh, the lexeme, so we are not skipping white space between these tokens, and that means that white space cannot be part of an identifier, right? So it's it's a an alpha or an underscore followed by but this sequencing operator is inside lexeme, so there's no white space skipping. It's an alpha or an underscore followed by alphanumeric or underscore zero more times. Uh, the raw, we're just using that to grab the uh, the the, the uh, iterator range that represents the identifier. Uh, and then a function call is an identifier followed by an optional argument list. So if it's if the argument list is present, it has to be open paren, followed by argument list, followed by close paren. It, it, it's optional, so the minus, this uh, min unary minus prefix operator in the template expression grammar that implements the domain specific language that is spirit to define our parser, it means optional. And then a primary expression well, it's either an imaginary, or it's a double that represents a real number, or it's a function call, or it's some expression inside parentheses. Now, because all of this stuff is expanding to a recursive descent parser, I want to call your attention to the order of these two alternatives. If I had written them the other order, we would have difficulty parsing the imaginary numbers because What's the difference between imaginary and a real? Well, they both can start with double. So I want to make sure that I try to parse it as an, an imaginary number first. So I look for double followed by an I. And if that's present, we'll successfully parse an imaginary number. But if it uh, was just a, a, a real number followed by something else that's not I, then this will fail to parse and we'll try to parse it as just a plain real number first. So when you're writing your rules that represent your grammar, you're going to need to pay attention to the order in, of uh, rules in uh, alternating choices here, alternation, if you will, choices, to make sure that you match the more specific one first by writing it first. So that is the grammar. We haven't looked at the attributes yet associated with these things. Each one of those rules is associated with a tag. 
and the tag has a corresponding rule where it's this x3 rule that has the tag and the associated attribute type. We haven't looked yet at what the AST looks like. We'll just look at these uh, associations really quick and then we'll go duck in to look at the AST. So there's the tag. Now here, instead of just declaring the tag as, you know, just a, a type, a named type that's used to discriminate one rule from another. Remember this first template argument to rule was the ID that's used to distinguish different rules and associate those uh, IDs with attribute types. Here I am making my tag derive from a thing called annotation. Not for every tag, but for some of the tags. And when, we, uh, when I explain how the uh, error handling works in detail, we'll, we'll see why that is. And you also see that down here for expression, it, it also, the tag also derives from this thing called on failure, which we haven't looked at yet either. But we're going to look at these tags really quick. Then we're going to look at the uh, abstract syntax tree. So an additive rule is associated with an expression from the AST. The multiplicative rule associated the attribute type is expression. The unary expert rule, the attribute type is operand. The imaginary rule attribute type is imaginary. The primary expression rule attribute type is operand. For the argument list, it's a vector of expressions. The identifier is just associated with a std string. So we did that raw. Uh, X3 raw uh, I'm drawing a blank on what they call it. What do they call it? Directive. Sorry. X3 raw directive produced an attribute pair sorry, an iterator pair as the synthesized attribute of this rule. And if you remember your std string you can can construct a std string from an iterator pair. So that's how this std string is getting associated with this sequence of characters that represents the identifier. Uh, and you always want to leverage the synthesized attribute propagation in Spirit X3 as much as you can to avoid having to write your own semantic actions to get the appropriate attribute type. Uh, so a function call rule is associated with the function call AST and our top level expression is associated with the expression AST. So let's now go take a look at the AST what we've done here. So I'm going to use an X3 variant which is just a convenience wrapper around boost variant and my little nil struct just kind of represents an empty AST. You shouldn't get it. Uh, if I wanted to, I could have tried to have the parser match empty string and produce nil, but I, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to require a value. So uh, an operand is a variant of nil, double, and imaginary. We'll talk about this forward AST thing in a second. It's either nil, double, imaginary, signed quantity, expression, or function call. Now, our AST represents a mutually recursive data structure. So how do you get a mutually recursive data structure? Well, what you do is you declare the names of the things you're going to use in your recursive data structure before you've defined them. So this is, these are declarations, right? They just saying this name is a struct. This is a declaration and a definition, but these are declarations. And by using this X3 forward AST, that's how we're getting the recursive variant that's going to have a tree structure in the, in the variant that represents the parsed structure from the input. So that's our operand struct. Uh, this is just bringing in uh, some uh, members to make them visible 
so a, a constructor for the base type and an assignment operator for the base type our signed struct so this is a signed value so it represents whatever character was the the unary prefix whether it was a plus or a minus followed by whatever it was in front of our imaginary is just a double so this is you know 5i turns into an instance of this struct where the value is just 5 we don't need to record the i it's it's associated it, it's implied by the fact that this is an imaginary struct and by using a struct here to wrap this double that allows me to distinguish it in the variant from the double that represents the real value of a complex number the operation here so uh, it's really would like this to be operator but I can't call this operator because it's a reserved word so there's the operator and the operand so if it's 5 plus 6 the 5 is the, a double and then the plus 6 is the operation with the operation is plus and then this 6 repre this uh, operand represents the 6 an expression is well it's an operand for the first part and then there's a vector of operations that represent all the rest a function call is a name and its arguments and these structs are derived from x3 position tagged in order to get rich and useful error messages so when we parse and it fails we'd prefer the parse to say line 2 character 5 you you may have a missing thing here so in order to remember that each of these um, AST operations where we could report a failed expectation so if we go back over here to our rules we see that some rules had an expectation that we have we are expecting a star followed by uh, we expect a unary expression to follow the star so that's why the sorry, unary exper is associated with AST operand and that's why operand I guess I should have had that. I might have needed that to drive from position tagged, but we'd have to write a test to see if it if it didn't record the position correctly. But let's say operation is part of an expression, and an expression is position tagged, and the expression is associated with our expression tag rule and the expression down here well it's just additive expert which has an expectation in it so if we if our AST type derives from position tagged then that AST node will have storage in it to record iterator positions of the the beginning and the ending of the text that matched that AST node so that's how we get the rich error reporting uh, for individual nodes is by having them derive from uh, x3 position tagged now all of this is just defining our AST type this x3 variant like I said it, it is wrapping a boost variant in a way that allows it to work with boost spirit but we're not done because the synthesized attributes in boost spirit don't quite yet understand how to propagate the tuples and sequences that it produces internally it doesn't quite yet understand how to propagate those tuples into our own application data structures so this is the glue so the uh, boost fusion is a library that's used by boost spirit 
So we're going to include our AST. That's just the, the definition of those structures. And then by using fusion adapt struct, it turns our AST type into a vector of types. The, you can think of a fusion vector as a kind of a template programming vector of types as opposed to a vector of values. And by adapting our AST structures using boost fusion adapt struct, Spirit will be able to automatically map these synthesized attributes, which remember Boost Spirit doesn't know anything about our AST. That's entirely up to our application. So using Boost Fusion Adapt Struct provides a bridge to allow Boost Spirit to take its internally synthesized attribute type and propagate those synthesized attributes into our own data structure. So let's just refresh ourselves again. This AST.h contains the data structure that defines the nodes of our abstract syntax tree, our AST. I'm using an X3 variant to represent things that are alternatives. And I, uh, you know, I happen to encode it in this operand thing. And then, you know, my other uh, structs are mutually recursive with operand. It, you can slice and dice it any way you want. It, it doesn't, it's not required that you put the variant on operand. It's just the example I was cribbing from uses that, so that's what I used. Uh, the position tagged business is just so that we have a place to store iterator locations for when we get an error message and we want to be able to say, I wanted this thing, but I didn't find it, and here's the line and location where I was looking for it, and I didn't find it. Um, so our AST is just defining the application data structure. This AST adapted is taking that application data structure and using boost fusion adapt struct to provide a bridge between the synthesized attributes that spirit will create internally and our application structure now the only thing I haven't really talked about yet is the error handling so let's go look at that so there was this error handler business associated with the parsing context and I instantiated an error handler down here, and then I associated that error handler with the parsing context, and the parse and the uh, sorry, I associated the error handler with a parsing context that was in turn associated with the expression rule, and then I used that to do the parsing. The error handler itself. Let's go look at that. So I am basically using a built-in error handler from uh, utility support utility header in Spirit X3. So I am using the X3 error handler, and the X3 error handler can print the failure message in a form similar to the diagnostics you get from Clang, where it says, you know, line six, you know, and it. It, it, it spaces over a little up arrow character to point at the place where it says, I was expecting this to be here and it wasn't here. That error handler is provided by Spirit. So I'm just using the built-in error handler. However, we have to annotate, for that to work, we have to annotate our AST nodes with the um, iterator locations when those AST nodes are successfully parsed. So this uh, annotation thing, if you remember down here on our tags, we had tags associated with or, or deriving from this annotation struct and our top level tag was deriving from on failure. I guess before we go into annotation, we'll look at on failure really quick. So this guy when we get an error, the uh, error handler will be passed the iterator pair representing uh, the, the range that we were trying to parse, the exception that we encountered, and then the parsing context. Uh, we'll ask the exception, ha the, ex the exception that gets thrown is a bad expectation exception. 
when we were using the expectation operator and the expectation was not met. So by asking it what it was expecting, we will get the string name of the rule that it was expecting to match that did not match. So we get the string name of the rule from the exception that was thrown. We look up the string name in a little table, the, the rule name in a little table just to map it to a human friendly name of what we were actually expecting because really for all these intermediate rules in the grammar, it's an expression that we were expecting. The user's going to understand expression. It doesn't, the user doesn't care about whether it's an additive expression or a multiplicative expression or a unary expression or a top level expression in parentheses. They don't care. Oh, this is, I got that duplicated. Ha, take that out too. They don't care. Those, for the purposes of explaining it to the user, those are all just expressions. So we're just using this little string to string map to map the name of the rule which we assigned to each one of the rules that we instantiated, the name of the rule gets mapped to whatever English name we're going to use in the error message. So we look it up in the map, and if we found it, then we use the value in the map. Otherwise, we just use whatever was given to us from the exception, which is, again, it's going to be the rule name, but it's better than nothing. So our message is that we were expecting something at this location. We're going to fetch the error handler from the parsing context, this little guy is an on error callback that is essentially when we saw that we had semantic actions attached to a parser, the semantic action was being invoked when the parser matched. That was an on success callback. This is the opposite, that when the parsing fails, it's the on error callback that gets invoked. We're going to get our error handler, which is the built-in error reporting error handler from Spirit X3. We're going to call that error handler with the location of where it happened and the message. And then it's going to use that location, this where, result of this where function on the exception. And then we're going to tell it that um, the result of this error handler is fail. You could write a fancy error handler that maybe could recover parsing and do something else. and it wouldn't return fail, it would return something else. So that's our on failure base class that our tag, sorry, up here, that our tag for the expression was deriving from. The other one, the annotation tag, it's got an on success callback. It's got two variants. They're, they're basically doing the same thing. That is getting the uh, on the on the error handler instead of invoking uh, the error message we're going to invoke this tag member so this is part of the error handling that's coming from spirit we can call this if we, in fact if we go look at this function go look at this class rather you see that there is a position cache that it is managing and there's this tag function that annotates the position cache with an AST node and an iterator pair. So that's what we are doing in our error handler. Sorry, our, our annotator. We are associating on a successful parse the AST node that was parsed with a pair of iterators. Uh, we can access that information when we're parsing our AST. If we care about the iterator positions, you could use those iterator positions to look more deeply at the raw text, including white space. Remember that when we're parsing, unless we're using a lexeme directive, the white space gets skipped. But suppose we cared about the white space. We could go and examine that iterator pair associated with the AST node to examine the white space in detail if we really cared. So that's what annotation is doing. Uh, just take a look down here. So these nodes that are derived from the, where the, the tag is derived from annotation, we are using that to attach 
an on success callback to this tag associated with the rule and then spirit uses template machinery to say oh you have an on success handler so when the rule matches and I have successfully matched input for that rule I will invoke your on success handler similarly for failure when this rule for expression fails it will invoke the on failure callback associated with the tag so this this derivation machinery on the tag is just a way to get boost spirit aware of our on success and on failure callbacks okay so a lot of information in there um, this example uh, that the formula parser example is you know demonstrates how to get annotations into the source input for matched AST nodes it demonstrates how to use the x3 variant struct to get a sophisticated AST structure that is parsed out it demonstrates how to do the error handling and print the error message um, if in fact let's go over here to the test code and run the one that fails we'll put a breakpoint here and we will run this test case in the debugger I touched a few things so it's gonna build a little bit okay so if we step into this code again construct that basic string get inside here let's scroll this up a little bit we've instantiated our error handler we've instantiated our parser that's just got a context that has the error handler associated with it we're gonna call phrase parse phrase parse returned false so it did not match it was not able to successfully parse the input although it consumed all of the input it was not able to successfully parse it and when I grab out that error string let's just go over here it's saying it's in line one error expecting expression here so it's shown that it parsed the three it parsed the plus and then it was expecting an expression to be present after the plus and it was missing and that's drawn that with a little up arrow here just like Clang will tell you when you've got pieces missing from your source code so we return that and the parsing failed and the error string was non-empty so there's not much more that you would need in a real-world example than in this uh, formula parser uh, because we're annotating locations in the AST we are using a recursive data structure for our AST to represent the recursive the mutually recursive relationship between the rules and the grammar we are doing fancy error messages um, if you just need to do some kind of simplistic parsing you can look at this uh, really simple guy it's not got fancy error messages and it doesn't have annotations on the resulting AST data structure but uh, maybe this is more appropriate for what you're trying to do if you can't create a custom abstract syntax tree data structure for the the value that you're trying to parse you know the value that you're the data structure you're trying to parse into might be some third-party data structure that you don't have control over you can't change it so you can't make it annotate can't make it derive from the annotation uh, framework and you can't um, make it uh, use a, a you know boost variant um, if you need to parse directly into somebody else's data structure this uh, simple parser is probably more like what you want to do but if you have your own internal freedom where you can describe the AST in any way that you like then the formula parser is, is a closer example uh, where we get to define everything the AST uh, and you know we could I mean in my uh, let's go back over here to the test code 
you see that I'm I'm using the AST data structure directly as the return value from the the parser. And you know, yeah, you can you can dig into it if you want. Oh, we didn't look at the uh, didn't look at the the visitor pattern. So just really quickly, this is just standard um, variant kind of stuff. But if I define a class and then I create a function call operator member of that class for all of the types in my variant so nil double imaginary signed expression function call and operation then I can use uh, the boost apply visitor pattern so I can use a, a, what's called the visitor pattern where what's going to happen with a boost apply visitor is it will take this is the type of the visitor and then this is the thing that I am visiting and apply visitor will say oh uh, the thing that you're visiting is of type AST double colon operand so I will invoke the Oh, I didn't have an operand. How does that work? I think I'm missing something. Operand. Oh, operand is just another variant, right? So it's it's recursively. Operand is the variant. Duh. So for operand, over here, so we're applying, we're doing boost apply visitor, and the, that takes a reference to the visitor, the thing that is going to be invoked for each item in the variant, and then the, a thing that is visitable. Now a variant is visitable by it will look in the variant, so this operand is the variant, it will look in the variant, find out which type of thing is in this variant, and then it will invoke the appropriate member function on the visitor for the type of the thing that is in the variant. So, this might be clearer if we see how it runs. So, I create an instance of the visitor. I'm just attaching the visitor to my O string stream here to get the capture the output of the visitor. And then I'm going to invoke the visitor that's invoking the function call operator on this expression type because that is the result of my parse, is the AST double colon expression. So the first thing we check is if, you know, if this expression has, if we look at the AST type for expression, it has a first operand and then a vector, vector of operations that is the rest. So we're looking to see if it has stuff in the rest, then we're going to surround that stuff by a parenthesis. So we're doing that. Now we're going to apply the visitor on the first part of the expression. And that is going to be an operand. And an operand is the variant. So we, in this case, I think it's going to be the double. So if we put a breakpoint here and we step over apply visitor, we get into the uh, function call operator for double, which just inserts the double into the stream, the print the stream that we're printing, and now we're going to step out of these functions. This is all the machinery of the visitor, imp uh, the visiting algorithm implemented for boost variant. You can see it's a bunch of stuff. It's not particularly interesting. We just keep stepping out. Oh, it's a bunch. You may be thinking all this stuff is a is expensive but it's all inline template code a lot of it just expands away into into uh, inline function calls okay so now we're back in our code we did the apply visitor on the first part and then for the rest of it we're going to invoke the f our function call operator on each of the remaining pieces the first one is an operation so we output what the operation was in this case it was a plus and then apply visitor to the rest of, of the expression and then it's another double inside there and again we're stepping out out of all this visitor stuff
almost back to my code. Here we are, we're back to my code. We're stepping out of that. There was only one thing and the rest, and now we were, it wasn't empty, so we're going to output the parentheses, and then we're going to st step out of that. And then this value that we constructed, sorry, the string that we constructed, is parentheses 3 plus 4 with a space around it. So what we parsed was 3 plus 4 with no spaces, but what we got out was 3 plus 4 with a space around the operator and the whole thing surrounded in parentheses because it's a top-level expression. So similar to this printer visitor, the more common thing that you would do instead of dipping your fingers directly down into this, you know, variant business and trying to grab all these things. You would write your own visitor to traverse your AST. It maintains some internal state that's the result of the processing of the AST. And because you get to decide how the left and right hand sides of expressions are traversed. You can decide if it's a pre-order traversal or an in-order traversal or a post-order traversal. It's up to you to define how this structure is traversed. But the visitor pattern is going to be more useful for traversing your AST than grabbing stuff out of there manually. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. Uh, it's hard to cover these advanced topics succinctly, but I hope that this gives you an example of how to do either just a simple straightforward parser or a more complex recursive, mutually recursive descent parser. Uh, if there's any questions, we will take them now. Otherwise, we will be good to go. Okay, not hearing anything, so we'll wrap it up there.